day is brighter here with you the night is lighter than it's you would lead me to believe which leads me to believe you make everything glorious you make everything does that make me my eyes are small but they have seen the beauty of enormous things which leads me to believe to see that you make everything glorious you make everything glorious you make everything glorious and I am yours from glory
seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. And every high and soul began, my anchor holds with Jesus is Lord of all, and that is, that is great news, isn't it? All right, well, we have some more great news this morning. Before we jump into God's Word, um, we have two very special guests here this morning. Yesterday was kind of a big day for them, um, all the way from Arizona and Oklahoma. We have Rich and Janet Nail Schoonmaker, so um, pretty cool. So why don't you guys stand up? If you can. Isn't that cool? And they, they wanted to be here today with us and worship Jesus with us. And then even better than that, Janet and Rich are two of the people that are getting baptized today at our picnic. So um, that's going to be exciting. And we have several people getting baptized today. But hey, if you haven't heard about it, we have our church picnic and our baptisms today. And it is right down the street. If you haven't signed up, already don't worry you can still come today it's gonna to be a beautiful day um, it's at Roselland's house which is 1018 Prospect Ridge this is the 1700 block of Prospect Ridge so you just go down about six blocks but I don't think everything's a block but you just go down almost to the end of Prospect Ridge it's on your right side 1018 she's got a pool which is beautiful we'll have plenty of food we'll have plenty of fun but Here's what I do have to tell you. This week, I was in to uh, meet with the police chief. I meet with him regularly to see what's going on in town and how we can be praying for our officers and everything. And I happened to mention to him, hey, we're having our church picnic this week, and it's going to be at one of our members' houses on Prospect Ridge. And I just realized we have a lot of people coming. I said, what do you suggest we do about parking? I said, I don't want everybody getting tickets. So he said, all right, here's what you can do. So for parking, listen up. Here's what he said we can do. First of all, if you're going to park on Prospect Ridge, just park on the one side of Prospect Ridge, or as you're going this way, on the right side. And don't block anybody's driveway or anything like that, but park just on the right side. Then, before you get to Roselland's house, you'll come to a street, Lake Street. That street's wide open. You can park on either side of that and fill that up. And he says, and then, if it's still too crowded, he says, just have people walk, so... 
I said, good, we'll do that. So we'll try to, try to make sure we're all okay to, today with the picnic. And like I said, it's going to be a great day and just a great time. So don't miss it this afternoon um, as we uh, fellowship together, as we have fun together, and as we celebrate together. So that's pretty exciting. Also, um, I don't know if you heard the news this week, but our own Barb Cunningham passed away this week. Um, but man, every time something like that happens, I, I just think when we're singing praises to Jesus, I'm thinking of Barb, she's face to face with Jesus singing praises. Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful thought? And, and Barb uh, was taken home, and she is face to face with Jesus this morning. And um, so that's a blessing, but we want to pray for her family and for God's peace upon them um, because it still hurts. So we're all, uh, we'll lift that up to God as we prepare to go to God's word this morning. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for loving us and for calling us to be your own, Lord. It's only through Jesus that we can stand before you, that we can be right with you. It's only because of Jesus that we can gather together in unity with you as our focus. And Lord, as we've sung praises this morning and now we, as we prepare to look at your word, Lord, your word is perfect. In fact, it is as true today as when it was first written and it has the power to change our lives. So as we look at your word this morning, teach us, not just to fill our heads with knowledge, but teach us in a way that we can respond to your word and leave here looking differently and acting differently because of it. And Lord, we pray for those that aren't able to be here this morning, Lord. We, we think of Barb Cunningham's family this morning and pray that you be the God of all peace and comfort to them and can comfort them with the knowledge that she um, loved you, she trusted you, and she had a, relation, a living relationship with you and is now in your, your presence. But Lord, lift the family up in due time and give them your comfort. Lord, for those that are sick among us, Lord, we pray that you bring healing to them and make your presence known to them in a real and a mighty way. But for us who have gathered this morning, Lord, um, let us come to you to hear from you this morning. Whatever we may have brought with us that may be keeping us from um, receiving what you have for us, Lord, let us lay it before you, surrender it to you so that we can be changed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but one of the things I love is history. So I'm going to tell you about an event in history um, that took place back in 19, 1952. It was February 1952. Um, and there was a furious winter nor'easter happening um, just off the coast of Massachusetts. And as night fell during the midst of the storm, there was this tanker that was motoring just off the coast of Massachusetts. It was called the SS Pendleton. And the storm was so fierce that it took this huge tanker and raised it up and split it in half. And the front half of the tanker sunk. And somehow the back half of the tanker was still floating. And there were 30 sailors on that back half of the tanker clinging to the rails for dear life with little hope of rescue. And what these sailors didn't know, though, that... Um, after it split apart, they got a Mayday call off, and it was received by a local Coast Guard station um, that was nearby. And they had nobody that really that could go out except three guys. And despite uh, some of the local residents who were all watermen, they said, there's no way you'll go out in the storm and survive. Despite all those warnings, three Coast Guardmen hopped into a 36-foot lifeboat, tiny 36-foot lifeboat, to go out of the harbor over this treacherous bar to go out into this storm in the middle of the night to rescue these sailors. And as this scene unfolds of the ship going out, it's actually, um, it comes to life. This true story comes to life in the movie The Finest Hours, if you've ever seen that or heard of that. And it's recounted in this movie. But as the movie shows, that they, they come out through, through, this, through the waves, and there's no way they should be living through this. But as they come, and then they, they, they show the sailors clinging to the ship, and they're looking out into the darkness. And then all of a sudden, you see this small light out in the darkness, out in the storm coming their way. And it's the searchlight from this little lifeboat coming to bring res rescue. It was, in fact a magnificent glimmer of light in the darkness. And you know, this scene 
that, that, that this movie paints. It's similar to one that Paul paints in Romans chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you open up to Romans chapter 3. If you don't have your Bibles, you can check one out on your phone, I guess, or, or we have Bibles in the pew in front of you. Romans chapter 3, you can kind of open up there. And while you're turning there, um, if you haven't been here as we've been on our journey through Romans, I want to bring you up to speed where we are. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he writes this letter to these churches that are in the city of Rome. And these churches were made up of young believers who were facing terrible persecution for their faith. And they were trying to share Jesus in an ever-worsening society. But there was also internal tension going on in the church because the churches were made up of Jews and Gentiles who were struggling to unite together. So in writing this letter to the churches in Rome, Paul shares with them the one and only thing that would encourage them, unite them, and make an impact in their world. And that is the gospel, the good news of salvation and rescue in Jesus. However, what we've been finding in Romans, uh, Paul approaches it a different way. You see, to, to really grasp the good news of the gospel, you first have to understand the bad news, the really bad news. And Paul's been um, unpacking that for us in the first two and a half chapters of Romans. It's this bad news where he talks about our biggest problem in life, and that's sin. Sin, it's... it's disobeying and disrespecting God through our, our thoughts and our words and our actions. And this sin infects everyone completely. There are none that are righteous, he says. It doesn't matter what good deeds we may have done. It doesn't matter our, our background or our religious fervor. Sin places everyone under God's judgment, separating us from him. In fact, as Paul shares this bad news, it can be summed up like this, and we talked about this, this last week. There is no way around our sin problem. It completely traps us. There is no way out of it. We're all done. We're doomed. That's pretty bad news, isn't it? And you're sitting there going, man, oh, this, is, this is a happy day. Yeah, it gets better. Trust me. But really what Paul's saying is he's saying our attempts to become right with God or to be acceptable to God, they're futile. They're useless. And, you know, I was trying to kind of come up with a picture of what this kind of futility looks like, of us trying to, in our own efforts, be, be good enough for God and, um, or to overcome sin with God and what it amounts to. And as I was thinking about it, I came across this, this short little video clip that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> you catching what he's doing? <laughs> you see, our attempts to find righteousness with God is trying to bail out water over a chain link fence. We're just wasting our time. There's no way we're doing anything about it. We are powerless in and of ourselves to measure up to God, to secure forgiveness of sin, and to secure an eternal, wonderful relationship with God. This is bad news. And Paul has set the stage now because now, beginning in verse 21 of chapter 3, he shares a magnificent glimmer of light. In the midst of all of this bad news, there is good news. As a matter of fact, really good news. We have but one hope, and it's outside of ourselves, outside of our efforts. That hope is rescue. In fact, let's read what he's talking about. Starting in verse 21, let's read, and then we'll, we'll talk about it after we kind of read through what Paul's saying. Verse 21, he says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested or revealed apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. 
There is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance or his patience, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that, or his perfection at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. It's out. By what kind of law or principle does this work? By the law of works? No, but the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Well, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one. He will justify the circumcised by faith, or the Jews by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith, or the Gentiles by faith. And then he gets back into the subject of, well, what about the law then? Why are we obeying the law? He says, do, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? And Paul says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law, or we fulfill its purpose. So we'll stop there. There's a lot here, isn't there? And as we talked about when we first started this journey in Ro in, in, through Romans, Paul shares some pretty meaty, what we call theological truths throughout this letter that we need to unpack or understand. And our passage this morning is about as meaty as it comes. So you came on a good week getting lots of meat this morning. But it can be really confusing. Basically, what Paul is describing here is what's known as justification. It's a big word, isn't it? I'm going to learn a lot of big words today, so you'll do well in your SATs, guys. But justification. Justification is being right with God and declared not guilty of our sin. That's what justification, it's a legal term. And this is what Paul is describing. And in justification, God rescues us from sin and to wholeness or restoration a restored relationship with God. So what we're going to do for our remaining time, I, I want to kind of unpack what Paul's talking about because there's a lot of really deep things, but when we understand them, man, this news just gets better and better. So we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at our passage so we can better understand what he's talking about and what it means for us. So as Paul begins this, he explains that this good news of rescue, this rescue from sin and to wholeness with God, is first of all, it's unattainable, yet it's freely available. He says this rescue, being right with God, it's unattainable in and of ourselves, but it's freely available to all. Being right with God, Paul says, is apart from the law, or it's not a matter of keeping the Ten Commandments or, or what Scripture says or through our efforts or attempts to be good enough for God. And this idea of the law for the Jews, they'd be reading this and, and thinking, well, he's meaning Scripture. So being right with God, having a relationship with God, isn't about us keeping God's law. Even though all of that Old Testament Scripture that God gives them points to it. It points to being right with God. You see, being right with God isn't about works. It isn't about our effort. But rather, as Paul says, being right with God is all about faith. Now, here's an important truth about faith. It's this. Faith is only as good as its object. If we put our faith in something that's horrible, faith is worthless. Faith's only worth something if it has a great object of our faith, or faith is only as good as its object. So Paul is clear that this faith that brings righteousness or this right relationship with God, it's not in ourselves, it's not in our efforts, it's not in others, it's not even just faith in God in general. But rather, it is faith in Christ Jesus alone. 
You know, Scripture speaks to this. And John, one of the passages of Scripture, I'm sure we might have all heard at some point, is John 3, 16, right? For God loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, in Jesus, has eternal life or has this relationship with God. So Scripture is pretty clear. In fact, Jesus himself said this in, in, in regards to... Um, this right relationship with God or being right with God. He said in John chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's pretty clear, isn't it? There is one way, one truth, one life. There is only one object of faith that rescues. Jesus. Jesus alone. In fact, this faith in Jesus is how anyone and everyone is rescued. There's no, Paul says there's no distinction. Just as we've all sinned and we fall short, we're all rescued through Jesus. Only one way. And just as sin is this great equalizer, making everyone equally guilty to God. Jesus is the great equalizer, making all who believe or trust in him alone justified or right with God. And you know, this helps us. If, if we can understand and grasp this, you know what this helps us do now? We now have something that we can share with our world of value. You go to work tomorrow or you're with your friends and you're like, man, I wish I had something I could share with them that would help them in life. You know we do? And it's one thing. Jesus. It's nothing we bring. It's, it's not, you know, salvation, it's not found in good morals. It's not found in just finding peace or feeling good about yourself. It's found in Jesus. And when we grasp that, we can always keep the main thing the main thing in our lives and in what we share. Jesus alone can save us and save anyone for that matter. That's what Paul's saying. And here's why Jesus is the only way. It's because of what he did. And then Paul goes on to share what Jesus did. In fact, the, the good news of rescue from sin and to wholeness with God, it's accomplished at great cost, yet it's freely given. Jesus accomplishes being right with God at great cost. There is a cost involved. You know, we talk about, well, no, I freely come to faith. Yeah, that's because Jesus paid the price. And beginning in verse 24, we see that, right? That the cost paid and the gift given. And he gives it with some really meaty terms. And right now, we're going to learn some really deep theological terms right here, but we're going to break it down so you understand it. And the first that Paul talks about is about freely given. He talks about a big concept called grace. You know what grace is? Grace is the unearned, undeserved favor and blessings of God. God freely gives us what Jesus accomplishes for us to all who place their faith in Jesus. That's grace. And then Paul goes on to say, well, what did Jesus accomplish or what price did he really pay? Well, first of all, Jesus paid the price himself, which is something that will blow our mind when we really think about it, okay? Jesus, God in the flesh, came to pay what we owed him, our debt to God. Just Think about that for a minute, okay? We offend God. So we're the offender. God is the offended, okay? We broke his law, so we owe him something. So God is owed something. We're in debt. Well, instead of God sitting there saying, so you better shape up, or I'll wait till you pay me. You know what God does? God says, you owe me something, I'll pay it myself. Whew. Who does that? Jesus, that's who. I mean, it's crazy to think about, isn't it? But it's huge that this is what God does for us. Now, how did Jesus pay this, this debt that we owed? 
Well, first, Paul says, it was through redemption. And that's another big word we're going to learn about. Redemption, it's actually a business term describing a business transaction. So Paul says, Jesus actually did a business in tra- um, transaction for us. And when Paul's talking about redemption, redemption back in Paul's day referred to more often than not, it referred to the slave trade. You see, some people that were slaves, and slavery was rampant in the Roman Empire, and if you were a slave, some slaves were able to save enough money where they could buy their freedom back from their owners or redeem themselves. Now, we're unable to do that, right, because of our sin. We can't purchase our own freedom because we're slaves to sin. We're unable to buy our freedom or be perfect enough for God. Yet Jesus is that perfect. So Jesus, in redemption, it means that Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live. He perfectly fulfilled God's law, earning freedom. And Jesus gives this freedom to all who place their trust in him. And he gives it to them as a gift. He redeems us from being slaves to sin and frees us to live in a whole and intimate relationship with God. Paul talks about this many times in, in, in a couple of his letters. In fact, one of his letters he writes to churches in a, in a region in Asia Minor called Galatia. And he tells this to the Galatians. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, or Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might be might receive adoption as sons. And down in verse 7, he says this. He says, so we're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is what Jesus does for us. That's redemption. Now, there's another price that Paul talks about that Jesus pays, and it's in verse 25. He says that God put forth Jesus as a propitiation. Isn't that a great word? Everybody say that. Propitiation. I just wanted you all to say it so you would spit on the person's back, back of their head in front of you, because you can't say it without spitting something, right? But propitiation. What is propitiation all about? It says it's, he put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. Well, this propitiation, it refers to a, a Jewish concept, a uniquely Jewish concept pointing back to the sacrificial system in the Old Testament where there would be um, a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, and the blood that was spilled or shed in that sacrifice would cleanse those who brought that sacrifice from their sin, at least for a time until they committed another sin, and then they would have to bring another sacrifice. So that propitiation is the cleansing of, from sin through a, sac- through a blood sacrifice, okay? And it would cleanse it for a time. However, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. So through his shed blood, through dying on the cross for us, those who trust in him are made clean from sin forever. Isn't that huge? Now, another word for propitiation, maybe a little smaller that you don't have to spit, is is atonement. If you've ever heard of the word atonement. You see, through Jesus, through the death of Jesus, he atoned for our sin, purifying us from the guilt of sin. In fact, a great way to remember what atonement is all about and this Jesus cleansing us is this. And this is a little trick I'm going to teach you. When we take the word atone and we just break it apart, let's break it apart. At one. Through the death of Jesus, his sacrifice, we are at one with God. Pretty cool, isn't it? That's atonement. So you hear all these big words, you're like, I don't know what this stuff means. Hopefully, we're getting to know what this means, right? And it's pretty good news. That through Jesus, now we're at one with God. So Paul's saying that God himself and Jesus, he gave us his perfect life that we're incapable of living. 
and he paid the penalty in his death that we deserved so that we can be free and clean before God. And he gives this to us freely with no strings attached as we place our trust in Jesus alone. And this work of grace, this undeserved, unmerited favor of God, that, that we get all this work of Jesus for us, the redemption and atonement, it now frees us to more passionately worship Jesus, doesn't it? When you grasp this, that Jesus did all this for you and it was nothing you deserved or earned in and of yourself, that he brought you at one with Jesus, hopefully we say, I'm ready to worship now. I'm ready to praise him and to thank him. And we do live joy, right? And we get that and what it means and the good news. And now finally, as Paul closes this, this, this introduction of good news, he does one more thing. He shares that this rescue from sin and to wholeness with God, yeah, you know what? It's hard to fathom. Yet, it's perfectly achieved. Do you know that? It may be hard for us to fathom, but we can trust that it works. It's perfect. At the end of our passage, Paul uses this diatribe, these, these questions, you know. He's... he's, he's giving answers to assumed questions that some of his readers might be asking while they're reading this of all this talk of justification because it's a little hard to grasp, right? So that's why he says, well, what about our boasting? Wait a minute, what do, what do we say we did? And Paul said, nothing. <laughs> then he starts answering some of the other questions. And he says, no, this is, this is flawless. You see... The whole idea how God makes all of this work is achieved flawlessly without diminishing who he is, without changing who he is. We're going to be doing this class coming up on the attributes of God. One of the attributes of God is that he's unchanging. He can't contradict himself. And what that means is that for God to be God, he must be perfect in all his ways and in all of his character so that he can never be one thing over another thing. And this whole thing gets sticky when we're talking about justification. When it comes to God making us right with him, you see? Because God is perfect in his love. He loves us so much. And because he loves us so much, he doesn't want anyone to be separated from him. He doesn't want anyone to face the punishment for sin. Yet, he's also perfectly just. And if he, if he overlooked that in his love and said, well, I'm going to overlook that, then he wouldn't be just. You see, being perfectly just means he has to punish sin. How do these two fit together? And sometimes we look at that and we say, it can't, but God makes it work. And here's how he makes it work. In Jesus. In Jesus, he makes his work. In, in verse 25b, Paul starts talking about it. He says in his forbearance or his perfection, God overlooked the sins that were committed in the past. Didn't mean he forgave them or that he said, oh, we won't punish them. You know what he says? He says, just wait. I'm not going to squash you yet. I'm going to be patient with you until Jesus comes because Jesus is then able to pay for what you couldn't. And now I'll accept payment. Now it's due. And you say, how can we pay it? Well, Jesus did. And this is how Paul says God becomes the just and the justifier or the lover of us through our faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that huge? Just to think about, that's a big concept, isn't it? And he further proved his faithfulness in that he deals with all mankind the same way. Because God is one, he deals with all mankind the same way. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you, you have to come through faith in Jesus, right? He says the circumcised come through faith, the uncircumcised come through faith, because we're all one. God is one. Rescue doesn't come through the law or works, but Jesus alone. In fact, when he's talking about the law, he says, but, but we can't throw out the law and say, well, if it doesn't come through the law, why do we even do the law? Or why do we even have the law? Here's why we have the law. Because God gave it and God's perfect, so there's a purpose. And he says, here's the purpose of the law. Do you remember last week, right at the end in verse 20, he says the purpose of the law was to reveal that we can't keep it. 
It reveals that we're sinful. So basically, the law is fulfilled in Jesus because we ultimately say, we can't do it, but Jesus can. And he says, therefore the law is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus himself talked about this on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount last week and we said, what is God's standard? Be perfect as my heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. And then they come to Jesus and they're saying, well, what are you saying about the law? And Jesus says in, in verse 17, he says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or throw it out or the prophets or the, all, all of Scripture. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota or dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And it was all accomplished when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead for us. Jesus fulfilled the law. Only Jesus can achieve our rescue. Only he can save. Only he can perfectly fulfill the law for us. So, when we grasp this, this is big, a lot to grasp today, isn't it? But when we can grasp all of this, that our rescue is not about our perfection, it's about Jesus. Then you know what? We can rest in him, we can enjoy him, we can follow him, rather than trying to work for something Jesus has already accomplished for us. You know how much time we waste trying to please God, trying to impress him, when we can never impress him, and Jesus already has for us? Now our time gets to be better used where we can enjoy him and follow him and say, all right, God, then what do you have for me? This is the good news, justification. It's unattainable, yet freely available. It's accomplished at a great cost, yet freely given. It may be hard to fathom, yet it is perfectly accomplished. You see, this good news is good, but you know what? It, comes, it becomes great news when we pair it right beside the bad news that Paul just shared. When we understand it in the light of the bad news, since we, because of our sin, are un utterly incapable of being right with God, we're doomed, right? We're hopeless, we're in need of rescue. Then that makes the work of Jesus on our behalf that much better, doesn't it? This rescue, it comes not through our effort, but through Jesus, who offers rescue and wholeness with God by living the perfect life we can't live, by paying the penalty, which is death, that we can't pay. To all who place their trust in him alone. You see, this is the good news. Grasping it will change our lives. But you know what? Sharing it will change our world. That's why Paul says we need to know this good news. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for loving us, for calling us to be our own. Lord, Lord I thank you for, for exposing our sin, our, our efforts, our meager efforts to try to impress you and to try to earn favor with you that result in utter failure because without realizing that, we could never grasp how great a love you have for us in Jesus. Lord, help us to have our focus on Jesus today, this week, as we go to work tomorrow, as we go to school, that we place not only our faith, but our hopes and all of our eggs in that basket of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and who he is, God in the flesh, the only one able to live the perfect life to pay the penalty once and for all of our sin. The only one worth following. So Lord, change us this morning as we grasp your rescue for us, the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand with us in praise of this great Savior? You came for Christmas.
criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man. So we're going to need some uh, help carrying the grill and tables up in about 5-10 minutes if we could get some hands to help with that. Otherwise, there's sign-ups for breakfast in Bethlehem on the uh, sign-up table, and I think that's it. Hope to see you all in, you know, 30 minutes at uh, Roselle's house. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and give you peace.
feet. A cross meant to kill is my victory. Behold. 